Okay, well, yesterday definitely messed us up a little bit here because uh, the one class uh, expected everyone to show up to on time because it was a major that there, we ended up having the class canceled for football. You know, I, you know, I'm an American football fan. I'm not a soccer fan, so, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But it did mess us up because... It, it, this being the last week of classes, there's no other time to schedule. So, oh, oh. so, you know, I'm sitting there racked my brain Sunday and yesterday trying to figure out when we can reschedule this lab, and I can't come up with a time that's there. So, the only thing I can say is that. You know, I, I've got two choices. One is I just simply, you, you know, you do it this week on your own and you submit a lab report before Friday on the three labs or what you get done, which is not what I intended. So that's really not a fair way to do it. That or I redistribute the points soon <laughs> that there. Uh, I suspect that most people probably would have done better on the lab practical than they would have with, with on the midterm or the final. Now I have, you know, I plan on getting your finals finished by the end of the day. That's there. Um, but right now, I'm going to say that we're probably just going to have to cancel the practical because there's no other time I can come up with the schedule. That's there. Because, yeah, you know, and I just learned a valuable lesson: don't schedule anything during the last lab period because a football game might cancel my class. I have never had a can a class canceled because of a football championship. That is a first in 31 year, 32 years of teaching. I have never had that happen. I, you know, I've, even when Purdue won the Rose Bowl, which is a huge, huge event, that's a national championship in American college football, the Rose Bowl, that there, when they won that, they didn't cancel classes at Purdue. And that's out of about 8,000 colleges that compete in the NCAA championship and to win the national championship usually means that the star quarterback of your team, who at that time was, uh, who was this? Oh, Drew Brees was a star quarterback of Purdue at the time. And he went on to get a multi-million dollar contract with the New Orleans Saints and played pro football for, for the Saints. So that tells you the, you know, the, the level of you know, what's at stake in American college football versus, you know, you know not to belittle playing or football team winning the national championship, but in comparison to, to something like that, that there. But regardless, uh, I have yet to decide how I'm going to redistribute the points. I'm going to try to do it as fairly as possible. Probably the best thing to do, since most people are going to get full credit for the labs, is I distribute them to the labs. Out there, maybe take ten points and distribute it to the midterm, and the other ten points and contribute it five points to each lab. That way, that there. So that's the easiest thing to do. It's not necessarily it defeats the purpose of the midterm exam or, or the uh, lab practical. That there, it just kind of drives me nuts. We didn't have. Okay, the purpose of today is to look at the final exam and kind of give you hints on what's going to be on the final exam. That there, the biggest hint is the midterm. I did post the midterm exam, right? That there, I took pictures of it, posted that there. I will get that done today before the before I leave today. Or after I sit on my desk, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to go put my headphones on and pretend I'm not there and get those finished along with all the lab reports. So, any grades that are not in by the end of today, please see me tomorrow. Okay, that there, I'm going to try to get them that there. So, okay, the final exam. right there. It's got five questions right there and I am going to go through them, tell you what they are. Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what they are, but I'm going to tell you the basic concepts right there. And if my finger, if my fingerprint works, I will look at it right there. Okay. 
I can tell you with pretty good certainty that these are the questions that are going to be on the final exam because I'm looking at the final exam right there. And nobody gets to seal this here. Unless you got a fingerprint, you couldn't you could see it anyway right there. So, all right, and it's that story. I'm looking at it. Through the cloud. All right, question one. One is, you know, I'm, you know, I've asked this question on almost every test, and I'm going to ask it again. Is what are the major differences between microprocessors and microcontrollers? You saw it on the midterm. You saw that there. Now, up there, one of the things that I is on the final exam that I have not asked before, and I just want to kind of point out is that if you notice in all of our work, you know, in terms of doing number crunching, that we have never used floating point numbers right there. We have not used floating point right there. And there's a reason why we don't use a floating point with a microcontroller. So I expect you to know that reason for the final exam. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I expect you between now and the final exam to look at that there. A hint is how much memory it takes to process a floating point number, but that there. But that is a question that I'm going to tell you is on there is why don't we use floating point numbers with microcontrollers right there. So I'm not giving you the answer. It's a little bit of an assignment to figure out what the answer is before the final exam. And it's worth about three or four marks on the final exam. So, okay, going back to question one, that's actually part of question one up there. Question one has got five parts to it. I just told you two of the five parts. There was a microcontroller and a microprocessor. Why we don't use floating point in a microcontroller. And the others might be, what does a crossbar do? Uh, that there, the various addressing spaces, that there, what they are and what they do. And again, these I think were on the midterm, so these questions up there. And we talked a little bit about serial protocols and knowing which ones are available up there. And the difference between serial and parallel. So that's question one. It's got five basic parts to it right there. So, and they're all explain or give the reason for or list that there. There's no programming in problem one right there. They all start with list at least, list the three, explain the role, list the various, explain the reason. You know, so I'll give you the first three words of all, all, five, all of them out there. So it's basically going into the understanding. Everything is well covered here in the lectures or the midterm or various places, except for the floating point question right there. Question two is a little bit more detailed. Question two, I get into two subjects right there. One subject is multiple clocks. When do we use what clock when? That there. We have external clocks. Why would we ever use an external clock when we got an internal clock? I've gave multiple reasons for that. You know, probably the number one reason I'll tell you the answer is the internal clock is only good up to plus or minus 20%. And to use a serial part, we've already determined we need plus or minus about 2%, right? In our lecture on serial ports. So that's there. We also talked a little bit about the speed, the, the power consumption versus the speed of the clock. That there. So those that there. The second part of problem two is how we interface with the LCD display. And that looked a lot, that question was pretty much on the, was on the midterm right there. You know, how do we interface with the LCD display and what's the purpose of the various control lines right there. So those were, that again was on the midterm, so you've seen that question before. And without giving you any kind of flat out hint, I didn't change the question. <laughs> so you, that question, you already know that question. Sorry, post the Problem three gets into the SAR, the A to D. All problem three deals with the analog to digital converter. So I expected a block diagram on how the SAR works. Out there again. Explain how we can get multiple inputs in with only one out there. In other words, know the depth, know what it, and by the way, on the midterm, a lot of people got that problem wrong. I haven't passed the midterm back. But a lot of people did not understand the role of the analog box back there. So when we look at problem three, you need to know what the role of the analog box is and how that works. And I, there's a drawing on the test that actually shows the box, but 
at there. But you need to know what the role of the analog mux is and why. And we did one lab where we actually set the analog mux up. We didn't get, go into that there. And then a couple of questions on how do you, you know, convert from A to, you know, you got analog voltage, what's the digital voltage you read, or what's, here's the digital voltage, what is the analog voltage that there. Everyone did pretty well on that on the midterm, as I recall, that there. So, but the, so problem three is strictly on A to D's right there. So that's 20% of it. Problem four is one that I'm a little worried about. I did a lecture and I posted a page on Facebook on motor control. If you recall, there's a lecture that I did and I don't think I have internet in this room. Yeah, no internet right there. But there's a there was a lecture I did probably about a month ago, and I posted a page from the Silicon Lab site on do on on. Um, and let me see if I even got the page. Desktop stuff. I may still have a page on that there. Uh, do 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 do. Inter LCD interfacing. And I don't see it that there. Yeah, I, I, I don't have it here. Um, there was a LCD on um, 34 data sheet. That's in state machine. Okay, but there was a there was a page posted on or a document posted on Facebook. I will try to repost it as a reminder on how we interface motors that there. And we talked about pulse width modulation and how that worked. There was a lecture on that there. So I'm a little concerned about problem four because problem four deals strictly with motor control right there. And it all comes from that one lecture that I did. So, I, you know, if I, if I, I really can't go any further than to say that you need to go back and look at that lecture. But that lecture had drawings like this, and it dealt, it used the F three hundred in that there. And you'll see something looks like this. You'll see twelve volts. That there. You'll see a motor right here. That there. There's a little, little dial here for right there. And then you'll see an output coming in here. And then you have some type of, so I'm not going to draw the whole circuit right here. There's a circuit right here that's drawn. And then there's a speed control pot right here, right there. There's a circuit that's drawn that looks like that. There's a couple of circuits drawn in that document right there. But look for that document. I'll post it. You need to understand how this circuit works. Right there, so it's all out of that one document that there, you know, on how motor controls in that one lecture. I did. I went through this in fairly good detail, but there is a question on how the motor control works that there. But you need to know explain how the timer produces PWM, what type of speed control, outline the program that you would need. But you need to understand basically how. And I went through that one lecture. I remember it really well. I can't, and as a matter of fact, it's probably listed if you go through Facebook on motor control. Right there, I, I can't. You know what? Give me a second here. I could probably tell you real quick. Give me a second here to. I don't have I don't have internet on here, but I have internet on this, so. <laughs> So give me a second and I can tell you the date of that lecture that there, because there's a lot on that one lecture and it kind of concerns me. So I want to make sure that we get back to that. Uh, okay, here we go. This thing keeps trying to connect to the Wi-Fi here and the Wi-Fi is very slow. Even my 4G is not going so fast here. That there, why is... 
Okay. So as I'm connected here. Oh, you know why it's not connected? Give me a second. Oh. Internet expired. You know, you use mobile internet. You have to repay. You know, recharge it every now and then. Okay, on November 16th, 16 November, I uploaded a document called AN191 PDF, right there. And the lecture for that date should be, is the date that you want to make sure you study. So, so I'm just going to point out that no. November is the date of the lecture you want to go back and review and you want to make sure that you look at AN191.PDF right there. That is the document that you want to look at. I can, I can tell you right now that at least one question, you know, in other words, 20% of the final exam is going to come out of that one particular lecture right there. So, so that, you know, I, you know, when you look at how many lectures we had over the course of the semester, we had at least, what, 15, six, 15, 14 lectures plus lab times used as lectures. So we probably had 20 lectures, and I'm telling you that 20% of the final exam is coming out of one lecture. I would really suggest that you go back and review that lecture, and also in particular review the lecture notes, because that lecture basically came out of one document right there. So it's like a four-page document, and I tell you, I only cover the first half of it. So, so that that there, I went through two of the circuits, and I went through the program and explained how the program worked. So that there. So as I look at the final exam question, right there, question four is all out of this one lecture right there, right there, and that's on motor control. So I covered PWM. I explained. I went through how the timer was set up to that. There, you don't need to know the details, but basically, I kind of went through how it, how the timer is set up, set up as a pulse width modulator, and I went through the various program that read the P, read the pod, and then used that number to adjust the PWM timer. So, so that particular lecture it covers is, is that there. Yeah, there's part A and part B, and part A basically just simply talks about how you would set up the pulse width modulator, and the rest of the problem is set up on how to, and actually it's supposed to be worth 20 points, but uh, 4, 4, 6, 6, yeah, that's 20 points. And then the rest of it is explaining how you would write code given a particular circuit that there. So there's 
two circuits and two different sets of discussions on that there. So problem four is basically all on motor control. Problem four is on motor control. And it's all covered in this lecture and on that document that's posted on November 16th right there. So getting now we're down to the last question. The last question has two parts. At there, the last question is two parts are each worth 10 points each. There's five questions each worth 20 points. There's no three questions on this exam. They've kind of changed the format to where I have to outline in each question a particular course outcome. So each each of the five questions covers a different course outcome. There's two the, these are problem five is a pro is two different programs that you have to write. So there is programming on this one. And I can tell you right off, one is going to be something that looks like either a keypad or an LCD out right there. And the other one is probably something that looks a lot like one of our labs. Is that there. That's that there. So we had two major labs. Two major labs. That there. One dealt with adding some. That there. That there. So figure where you're going to be. You guys are catching me just as I'm going to wrap up here in about 10 minutes here. So, <laughs> Okay, so problem five is actually a programming problem. So it's the most, it's probably the most difficult because, you know, you know I, I'll tell you the first three words of each of the part. There's two parts, each word 10 points. Part A starts with the phrase, write a function to. <laughs> so that's problem Problem 5A is you'll have to write a function right there. Part 2 is write a short program that will. Mm -hmm. So it's going to look a lot like the lab, two of the labs we did. That there. So problem 5 is straight out of two of the labs. And we only did two, two or three labs. So... So it's going to be right out of the labs, right there. So, and that's the final exam. Five questions, right there. You know, my hints are pretty much straight on. I can, I have, I've been teaching for 30 plus years. I think I said 32, somewhere around that neighborhood, right there. I, I, I do not lie on what's going to be on the final exam. There's nothing on the final exam I didn't tell you. There's nothing I forgot because I was looking at the final exam when I was giving you the, the hints, and, and you can't see the screen from there. <laughs> I, I, I see the eyes wanting to catch a, catch a peek at that there, that there. And even if you could see it from there, I've already told you what it's going, what what it is right there. So that there. So there's five questions. Two of the five questions are going to come right out of the midterm. You know, they're going to look just like the midterm. At least a third of the final exam is going to look exactly like the midterm. And the other parts of the final exam are fairly straightforward. One is motor control. That's one out of the five questions. It's all coming out of that one lecture, November 16th, right there. So anybody who was not here on November 16th definitely needs to go back and re-watch re that, re that lecture. Right there. You have to answer all five questions. Yes. There's no pick four out of the five. No. That that format's been changed with the way that they changed the uh, the, the way that we're doing assessments at, at there. I prefer the four out of five. But to be honest, if I, it was four out of five, then everyone would skip problem five. <laughs> at there. Actually, problem five is not that difficult. That there, that, that there, because problem five, you know, we look at the labs we did. One of them was what the keypad, right? That was one lab we did. That there, so and I gave you the program before, and I said you better know it on how to write a function to read the keypad. That there, we didn't do a lab on the LCD, so I can't really do that one. That there, we did Blinky. That's one that we did. That there. And then we also did a lab on the stoplight, right? 
that there, that's one. So it's probably going to be right in that area there. So, so again, writing, you know, re, you know, redoing the stoplight, for example, shouldn't be that difficult. And it's going to be something of that level right there, even if I modified it somewhat. Keep in mind that this is a final exam. I'm figuring you got five questions, 120 minutes. That means you've got roughly 120 or 24 minutes per problem is what is what you've got right there. You know, you got to look at it right there. So I have to do these problems where basically you can do them each in about 24 minutes, right? 20 minutes roughly per problem right there. So right there. that's really all I can tell you that's going to be on the final exam right there. I told you the problems exactly what they are right there. So those who came in late, there's five questions. Problem one is simply, there's no programming, no calculations, just simply give reasons and justifications for various things, right there. Go back and rewatch the first part of the video if you, if you missed that. Problem two, as I said, was, let me pull it up again. If I, what? Problem two, up. Oh. Okay, problem, problem one, list at least, list the three, explain the role, list the various, explain the reason. Yeah, that there, <laughs> yeah, you know, and then fill in the blank after that. I mean, there's more to it than this. But I told, I said, you know, as earlier as I told basically what those were. Problem two was on clocks right there and the LCD. So there's two subjects in problem, problem two, the LCD. And again, that problem is probably going to look a lot like what was on the midterm, right there. Problem, actually the first part of that problem is going to look a lot similar to what was on the midterm. It may be changed reward slightly. Problem three is all on serial analog and digital. We did one lab on that there. Right there. You don't have to write any programs for that, but you have to do some calculations on that there. Problem four. Explain, explain the type, outline the program. When I say outline the program, it means basically a flow chart right there. You know, a flow chart of what's going to happen, or a short little, I'm not going to be grading syntax. When I say outline the program, just kind of explain the steps. It could be a list of steps, it could be a flow chart, just so that I understand what you, you know, how you would write the program. I'm not expecting you to write the program. And then the last problem is write a C function that does something and write a short program that does something. And keep in mind that in, in writing the programs, you're going to be using a finite state machine in a select case, and we spent a lot of time looking at that there. So, problem five is actually probably if, if, I, if I had a choice and I had to narrow it down to one problem, I would probably just get problem five out there because that outlines the, the key thing that's there. So, even if I had multiple questions, it would probably do problem five and three of the other four. So problem five would be a must do anyway, but but it's going to be five problems. You have to do all five problems. Right there. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to go and hide and I'm not going to hide. I'll be up in my cubicle with my headphones up. And I will try to get every all the grades in the grade book before the end of the day. Right there. So if I don't get them in, or if you're missing grades at the end of the day and your classmates have got grades there, please come see me and make sure that I've got everything out there. It's not fair to leave you. Thursday, I probably won't be here. I have an appointment with the land department over some issues with our house. We need to change names on it, something like that. Friday, I will probably be here in the morning if there's something I need to be here for. Out there. Most likely, I'll be here Friday morning. Out there. The lab practical, I can't think of it any other time to reschedule it, so I'm going to redistribute the grades, five points per each of those two labs I'm great that are that there plus another five, probably put five points on the midterm and five points on the final, just kind of break it up and put five points, you know, scatter it around. And it actually hurts everybody to be honest because you probably would have scored higher on the practical than you did the midterm and the final. <laughs> that there. But since you only need 40% to pass the course, I don't think anybody's in danger of failing this class at this point. Up there, as long as that there, I, I think we're. I think most people are in pretty good shape. I mean, look, 
looked at the finals, not having recorded the grading, finished grading, but most people scored at least 40. Most people scored in the 50s and 60s, and some people scored well in the 80s and 90s on the final. Nobody scored below 40 that I could tell on the final, so, or the midterm. So you're in pretty good shape that there. And if you scored in the 50s on the midterm, and you learn your mistakes, you know, having, having seen it, you'll easily score in the 60s, 70s on the final out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if I get some people scoring up in the 80s, 90s on, on, the, on the final exam that there. That's what I that's what I had last time. My final exam isn't that difficult. You, and you've talked to your classmates out there. I think the semester before I came here, there was a high failure rate in this class. Since then, I don't think I failed anybody, so. Maybe I'm getting the reputation of being too easy. That there is that spreading around that I'm too easy. That there, no, no one, no one will say that, right? No, no one ever tells their classmates that an instructor is too easy. They'll say they, he's hard, but they won't say he's too easy. That there. So, but my feeling is is that the material, this material should be fun. It really should be. I and I know it's not fun for students here, here because programming is a challenge for. But why I think this material is more fun than other materials is once you get bit by the microcontroller bug in, in digital, you can actually see how easy it is to build things and make things and design circuits. And that's, where, that's what makes engineering fun to me. If I had to sit around and just keep an assembly line running that there, I would be bored to death. I, I have to create things. And that's where this particular type of engineering is more fun than power engineering. That there is you're actually getting to create things and put your own personality in, in various things out there. So when I look at over the years that the things that I did have designed that have gone into production that people have bought is more exciting than the assembly lines that I kept running because I designed a piece of test equipment to test a circuit board or to test a piece of electron or material to see if it's leaking or that there. I mean when I look at Test engineering versus design product design engineering. I'm much more excited about product design engineering. That there, unfortunately, the current job market is more on the line of test engineering and power engineering and building type design engineering than it is on the product design. Hopefully, that changes that you know as time goes on. Any questions? This was probably not my shortest class, but. It was